Welcome to Plus One Forward, the podcast powered by the Apocalypse, where we talk about tabletop role-playing games using or inspired by the Apocalypse engine. This episode kicks off our summer series about Firebrand's games. I'm your co-MC, Rich. And I'm your co-MC, Rach. Today, we're joined by our guests, Vincent and Meg Baker. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you. Thanks for having us on your show. So excited to have the both of you. Your games have meant a lot to us, as you might guess. (laughs) So for the past few summers, we have delved deep into different branches off of the core Powered by the Apocalypse engine. We started with Belonging Outside Belonging, went into Forged in the Dark, and this time we're doing Firebrands. And Firebrands, at least in my experience, is the wildest one of the bunch. It is very interesting. My first experience with it was at Camp Nerdly, which is going on as we record. Sadly, I've moved far away from Camp Nerdly and will not be there this time around. And uh, it was one of those like, hey, you could just take the book and start playing introductions, which was really interesting. Rach, what about you? What's your experience with Firebrands? So my partner, Rob, printed off a copy of the original Firebrands and made them as a series of little books and presented them to me as a present. And I was like, what is this anime thing? And how is it related to the little Lego game that we've been getting Kickstarter books from? And we played it a couple of times with some friends in the Toronto area who were also anime or Gundam nerds. And... I just found it really evocative and interesting because of the form factor and how it takes some of the ideas from Powered by the Apocalypse and turns them on their head. That's very cool. That is very cool. Setting up. In setting up, our guests will discuss some aspect of Firebrand's play culture, but I think we should take a step back and talk about the genesis of the Firebrand's games. So Vincent and Meg... What inspired you to create this game? One of the early inspirations that I have into this is the lightsaber dueling game that Vincent introduced me to in college, where one of us would have the Luke Skywalker book and the other one would have the Darth Vader book and be like, all right, now turn to it's this two booklets back and forth. And we really explored that in... Murderous Ghosts, but it introduced the idea of booklets that would play off each other or the books that didn't have to be, it didn't have to be a huge book. It could be something you held in your hand. And that was one of the things that I feel like Firebrands does well. And the Firebrands framework has worked well for people to do games out in the world that are like that, which is nice. That's my, that's one of the places that I look at it. Yeah. Lightsaber dueling was by West End Games. It's Empire Strikes Back era Star Wars game. Do you know this game, Rich? (laughs) I can't believe it. No, I don't know Uh this. You don't know this This one? You need to know about this game. Yes, please. Oh, I know of it. There was a series of fantasy ones that came before Lightsaber Dueling where I would have an ogre and you would have an elf or something. They were not called Fighting Fantasy. I don't remember what they were called. They were Flying Buffaloes games. Yeah. Yes. I think so. I Maybe. think so. But they go back to originally a game called Ace of Aces, which is about World War One biplanes. Ooh. And so I have a book that shows the view out of my cockpit in my biplane, and Meg has a book that shows the view out of her cockpit. And then depending on which maneuvers we do, we tell each other which page to go to next. That's very cool. To try to get behind <laughs> each other and shoot each other down. They're very cool games. And I have no idea why, when I was a kid, my family just loved that lightsaber. I mean, I have some ideas why my family <laughs> loved lightsaber dueling. <laughs> but that was one of the first encounters with my family, I think. You, yeah, You was. would have played it that summer. Yeah, and I also think one of the other big in, um, inspirations for Firebrands is games in a smaller footprint. When we had designed other games, you know, we're looking at a whole like long evening or all the details of the thing, campaign games, big games. Apocalypse World is a pretty big game. But this to part of it is, as Rach mentioned, the form factor. Like what can we fit on three pages? Yeah. So the I'd have to go back and look at when the nano games 
Oh, they they came happened. in cycles. Yeah. Like from from two thousand and two on. Yeah, or yeah. Whatever. But um, I know that that question: How do you make a game that is fully designed and delivers and is replayable in a small a small way? And then also also. This is not the first one because we have Eugene the Bracer. I game. yeah no I I can tell you many details about the origin of this game. Yeah. Is my guess. Yeah. But one of the one of the inspirations was a conversation that we were having at the time. Now, this game came out. I don't remember even what year. Twenty fifteen or something. Twenty fourteen. This one. But I had been working on it since two thousand ten. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, concurrent. We, we were working with this at the same time yeah. we were doing Apocalypse. Game. And at that point, it was a couple of games and then no connecting material. The reason it's a Mobile Frame Zero game, you mentioned, Rach, the Lego games. Yes. My friend Joshua and I, Joshua A.C. Newman, made a game called Mobile Frame Zero Rapid Attack, which is a tabletop war game that you build little robots out of Legos and they fight. And then... Oh, he had to republish that he had, uh, and wrote a bunch of setting material. And so we were talking about a Mobile Frame Zero role-playing game. And, you know, we, we talk about a Mobile Frame Zero role-playing game all the time. Like, we're still talking about it today. Um, hi, Joshua. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so we have lunch. And we have this whole conversation about Mobile Frame Zero role-playing games. And um, as I'm driving away, I have to stop the car because this voice says in my head, on your turn, pick a game. <laughs> <laughs> Vincent, this is God. I mean, it's worse than that. It's like, Vincent, this is your muse. <laughs> Vincent, this is game design. <laughs> Buckle up. So I came home and I wrote this game. Uh, it was three or four weeks. Uh, it was probably two months before PAX East. Yeah. And um, I premiered it at PAX East yeah. two months later or something. Yeah. Because because all of the games were written, it, it was just a matter of letting go of sort of the architecture I was trying to build mm-hmm. and replacing it with on your turn, pick a game. There's another piece, because for Mobile Frame Zero, it was our oldest child when they were little tiny tiny saying, what if there were Lego robots and they fought? And <laughs> with this, there was a bit which was, what is it called when there's multiple storylines going on? And the factions, Maybe. yeah, I mean, it's it's tangent, tangential, but it's one of those things that it could have been not factions. And I think that's really one of the strengths of the game. It could have been, been not factions? Yeah, it could have been all within one, you know, it could have been all within one household or all within, without, within the way that the setting material that came from Joshua was then filtered into Vincent yeah. on your turn, pick a game. It reminds me of, like, what if, what if there's multiple angles onto the same story? Ah. Another thing that was going on that we were in conversations about was social mechanics, social combat in role-playing mm-hmm. games. And right. when you try to make someone your friend by reducing their social hit points by making social attacks <sighs> on them until they run out of social hit points and now they're your friend. So awful. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and so, I'm a little opinionated. So... I was like, well, what if we treat combat as a social engagement instead of treating social engagements as combat? And so that's why meeting sword to sword works the way it does, is because I said, let's start with the point of view that this is a social interaction. You're trying to learn about each other, trying to get to know each other. Yeah. Sword to sword, trying to express yourself to each other and draw each other out socially. Yeah. So that's where that came from. And then there was this whole additional thing about this kid in Italy who said, Meg, you're wise and good, right? I Do you see that girl over there? I really want to talk to her. What do I do? Yeah, this, and was, this was good. Meg gave this kid amazing advice, advice that I wish I and everybody I'd ever met had when we were little. You can go find it online right now. It's um, I have, uh, like an app. I think if you look at if you Google McGee Baker and like how to talk to people or talking to people parts one and two, they're out there because it was it was how do I do this gracefully? Yeah. Or how do I do this? And I'm like, okay, grace, timing. Assume the assume, competence. Assume and, their competence. Yeah. 
Know what you're good at. Confidence and confidence. Yeah. It's good advice. It is. It's great advice. So Meg gave this kid amazing advice. And I said, oh, I can make a game. (laughs) And that's why the dance works the way it works. Mm -hmm. Everything gets filtered through being. (laughs) Like, I, I feel like there's a few things that everything in our life gets filtered through. And it's game design, sex education, textiles, or history. Some combination of those. That's where it all happens. (laughs) <laughs> That's cool. Is there anything more about design goals you want to speak to? For me, it was an experiment. I took a small number of them to PAX to see what would happen. That's not exactly design goals in the sense of what I wanted the play experience to be like, but it is design goals in the sense of what I was looking for as a creator. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This game had been in active production for years, mm-hmm. years and years and years before the, the switch that made it that made it firebrands and, and easy possible to create. And so I was really just happy to get it out. I don't know how much of a design goal you need when you're just really excited to get the thing out of your head <laughs> and into into the world. Meg already said our design goals for the play experience. You know, the small footprint and the one of the things that we were really doing was not this is a game for non role players, but this is a game that you can play as a role player. You can play with your non role player friends. Yeah, because it's not just the footprint. It, everything about it's like the social footprint. It's they're little. It's, it takes up a little yeah. bit of space. You can hold it in your hand. You're not handing someone five big hardbound books and saying, "Okay, in, in order to re- play this game, you have to read all these." Yeah, and the commitment is low, really low. And I think in terms of design goals, one of the things that I thought was interesting when we went to PAX was watching people get excited about it that weren't gamers, that weren't like traditional role-playing game folks. It was people who were at PAX East because of the anime or because of the video games, because they were like, oh, that they, they looked at the cover and like, oh, hey, hot anime pilots. What? Mac? Yeah. Gimme. And that was neat. I have a funny story about that. Okay. Which is that at that PAX, there was a dad and a kid, like a nine-year-old boy or something, who were kind of interested in it. And they were like checking it out. And and they were like, what can you tell us about this game? And I was like, that game has a lot of kissing in it. (laughs) (laughs) And so the dad sets it down. And these like other sort of college age people are like, oh, you're so You know? (laughs) Well, this and Meg, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Let's jump on over here and talk about specifically mobile frame. In case there are folks who came into this and are like, wait, wait, I don't know. I don't know what this is. We're going to jump over to challenges and let you tell them. The, the challenge. challenge. In challenges, that's our segment where we talk specifically about the game that our guest has designed for this episode our kickoff we talk about mobile frame zero fire brand so we've already talked about hot anime mecha pilots but like what's this about elevator pitch yeah like it's about the the messy lives of ace mech pilots no don't read that <laughs> it, fight with your friends ally oh. with your rivals and fall in love with your enemies is that what it says yep. That's pretty good. Yeah. But so the, you mm-hmm. you play the ace pilots of uh, mobile frames, you know, which are fighting Mecha, on this uh, isolated colony that has suddenly become very wealthy. And so there are three factions in the colony. There are the working class of the colony. There are the hereditary landowners on the, the colony. And now there are the corporate owners who suddenly have, have found the, their investment in this planet. Yeah, it's like it's worth money. Yeah, it's as if you were potato farmers on some little asteroid in the way back corner of the galaxy, and suddenly potatoes are the source of this incredible new technology, and they absolutely have to have potatoes to fuel it. So suddenly, the people who are just hanging out there growing potatoes. Suddenly, there's a ton of new wealth, and there's a ton of new interest. And it gets very messy. Yeah, and it, it's on the verge of war. The planet is on the verge of war over this yeah. um, because everybody thinks that they should own the wealth, the sudden, yeah. the sudden wealth. And so 
you are not playing at that sort of high political level. You're the fighter pilots, the ace pilots of these mobile frames, who you all know each other, you went to school together, you see each other every day, and now you're thrown into this conflicted situation. And so the game is about those love affairs and rivalries and fights and Doomed. It's all doomed. It's, it's doomed. Very romantic and tragic. Romantic and tragic. Romeo and Juliet in mobile frames. <laughs> Although really it's like Romeo and Juliet and Mercutio. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I'm a sucker for um Tibble. Tibble. Yeah. Just not, just so long as it's not Benvolio, because Benvolio deserves everything that's coming to it. Yeah. No. What mechanics are different in Firebrands compared to Apocalypse World? Firebrands is a game made up of mini games. Like I was saying a second ago, on your turn, you choose a game. Everybody opens to that page in their their book. Everybody has a copy of the book. And you together play that game. Some of the games everybody plays. Some of the games you choose one person and you two play while everybody else. Usually there's a a judge role or an audience role of some kind if, um, if it's just the two of you playing. But not always. Each of those mini games is like, and this is why I say from the beginning it's a Powered by the Apocalypse game, each of those mini games is like a really elaborate move, a multi-stage. It's like a move snowball. It's like its very own unique little, yeah. this happens, and then <clears throat> you follow where that goes. Right. And so if you meet Sword to Sword, um, <laughs> Meg opened it to this page. So Meeting Sword to Sword is a game that's for two players. So if, on my turn, I choose, hey, let's meet Sword to Sword. Meg, let's meet Sword to Sword. Okay. And so then we together decide why we're... we're. Each game has a different setup. That's yes. Like, each, like Meeting Sword to Sword, it's a two-page spread. Most of the games are two-page spreads. And they each have their individual setup condition that's a couple sentences. So like, all right, why are you Meeting Sword to Sword or... What's going on at this dance or whatever. And then we figure out different stuff and there's rules on that page for how we're going to conduct this duel yep. and uh, what the parameters of that will be and how we end the game. And yep. I think that's really important in terms of design for this. That it's, it's also how you end. <laughs> Things end. You know, yeah. the, the scene ends and then you go on to whatever comes next and it passes to someone else's turn. And you'd be like, okay, cool. Rach, pick a game. And, you know, but so it's like Apocalypse World in that this is a really elaborate single move that resolves the whole the whole scene, like mm -hmm. you say, the whole episode of mm -hmm. us having a duel. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't use dice, doesn't use 2d6. There is a character creation process, but you don't have moves or anything like that. It's, mm -hmm. it's more just choosing which faction you're part of and imagining what is cool about you, what makes you attractive. I think it's even... It's pretty much, yeah. yeah. But then you don't roll dice, and there's no GM, and there's no hit points. There's no all kinds of things. And instead, you have each game as a standalone move. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mobile Frame Zero Firebrands. Firebrands in my... I, I've played this and Once More Into the Void. Those are my mm -hmm. two experiences. And all the mini games are really interesting and evocative. The thing I haven't figured out yet is how do you move from game to game in a coherent narrative for your character? Yeah. Do you want to answer that or do you want me to answer that? Our answers are going to be different. They are. They're going to be really different. <laughs> you don't get to is my answer. Okay. I'm nodding along. There's definitely part of that. At the beginning of every game, you talk about how you got there. And I don't know if Firebrands allows you to decline a game. I can't remember. But it, it's not out of the spirit of the game for you to decline a game. Whether it says that or not, I don't know. But I know somebody who really struggled because somehow their character became the villain. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't figure out why. Mm -hmm. or And like I can tell them why. Like It was choices they made that made their character the villain. But they didn't see it that way as they were making those choices. And they couldn't turn it around, yeah. couldn't, had already committed to the character making those choices in mm -hmm. some way. And this is, I think this is kind of hardcore for an RPG design question, but the object of the game is to fight with your friends, ally with your rivals, and fall in love with your enemies. And you might not be able to do it because that's really hard. 
Like you have to. It, if, that's if out if of your control. Really commit, yeah. And it has to work that way for your enemy to fall in love with you, for you to fall in love with your enemy. You can't make it happen. And so in that sense, it's like a cooperative board game, and there's a chance you'll lose. There's always Mm -hmm. a a chance that you will not be able to do the thing. You won't be able to... Like, your character won't have a satisfying, coherent story, coherent arc. Part of it also is that you have your character concept that you create by going through the opening character creation for your faction, which gives you a lot of guidance of like, here are the things you're thinking about. Here is the the support systems you have in place. Here are questions that you might be wrestling with. So you, you have that grounded place and you can go back and play solitaire anytime. If on your turn again, you're like, okay, I'm going to play solitaire for a minute here. Everybody, you can go get a drink of water. I just need to recenter myself in my character. Fine. That's totally fine. But part of it is because the selection of the games passes around, it's not held with one person saying, and now there's going to be a chase, and now they're going to wind up at a feast, and now there's going to be a sword fight. Because that moves around, there's an element of that cooperative board gameness also in that. Because it's not just fight with your friends and lie with your rivals and fall in love with your enemies. It's also build something cohesive with your friends <laughs> that you're in the room with. So I've watched tables of this over and over where part of it is the yes andness of like, if we've just done meeting sword to sword and it's our two characters that are meeting sword to sword and your two characters are there in the room watching this happen. And then it's Rich's turn to choose a game. You get to choose if you want to see the immediate aftermath, you can say, all right, so it's that night at dinner. We're having an animated disagreement. Or you can say, all right, it's a week later and our characters might not even be in the scene, but it's that trust that we have in each other as players. We're spinning this thing. We're building this thing together and in handing it off, if I've chosen, let's meet sword to sword and so let's do this thing. And then I'm handing it off to you. Part of that is that I'm trusting that we're all trying to build something together. And so I have a responsibility not just to my character and my character's interest, but also when it gets back around to me, you know, and I'm like, okay, where's Rich's character's at? Where's Rachel's character at? Where's Vincent's character at? What are my goals in terms of fighting with my friends and falling in love with my enemies? What's interesting here? How do I pull that in? So there's a piece there. And yeah. sometimes sometimes you can do that and sometimes you can't. Yeah. Sometimes you can pay attention to that and sometimes you can't. Yeah. Yeah. King is Dead has a little more structure in that regard. I think it has a lot more structure. <laughs> um, and in Dreaming Avalon goes the other way where it matters far less mm-hmm. um, because all of the episodes are diversions. You aren't moving through an arc mm-hmm. the way you might be in Firebrands. Mm-hmm. If that answers your question. Yes, it helps a great deal. It really helps a lot. Thank you so much, both of you. Sure. Okay, Vincent and Meg, both of you, which of the mini games is your favorite and why? You go first. Okay. The um, (laughs) tragic, heartbreaking, breaking, gut punch skirmish is my favorite. Everybody hates this game. The tactical skirmish. Everybody hates this game but me. It's so good. I love it. Oh, you do? Yeah, of course I do. Oh, my God. But I, well, the thing is, what I love most is watching players' faces just fall when they are like, oh, shit, I, I can't win this. I, oh, God. So I love that. Love there's, that. There's a problem with it that I'm going to lead with. <laughs> okay. Since you asked why, I'm going to tell you why. So look out. The problem I'm going to lead with is that if you expect to have a cast of NPCs that you care about, <laughs> it will. That expectation leads you the wrong way in the game. For a future edition, which I can't. Well, I can, I can talk freely about a future edition. What am I talking about? Yeah, I'd like to do a, a deck of cards that has faces of your of your company on it. Um, Ooh, that'd be cool. Yeah, <laughs> just <laughs> partly so that you can have them out there in front of you, and partly to take the pressure off of the idea that you need to know these people. You don't need to. You just need faces, right? Like. I, and I think that'll work really well. 
But so the tactical skirmish works the opposite way you think it should. Let me see if I can <laughs> talk you through how it works. So I say that you, Rich, we've met on the field of battle. You you have a group of eight mobile frames. I have a group of ten mobile frames. You know, whatever. We're doing battle. We're shooting at each other. We're hitting each other with lightsabers, whatever it, we're doing. Importantly, it says in the rules, be prepared to identify each one by name, rank, code, relationship and to you or position in your force. Yeah. And that's all you need to yeah. do and people think they should know these people. But really all you need to do is invent a name. Anyway, but that's that's not the the thing. So I say Rich surrender right now or you pin my force down and take out my cousin who's our sharpshooter while we're struggling free. Rich, submit now, surrender now, or you pin me down and kill my sharpshooter while we're struggling to escape. Do you surrender? No. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Exactly. You're like, no, why would I surrender? I'm not going to surrender. I'm about to shoot your guys to crap. So now it's your turn. And you have to say, okay, Vincent, submit now, or you catch my second lieutenant at an inattentive moment and cut him to pieces. And now I'm like... Huh, maybe I won't surrender. <laughs> it just choose you, you have to you, you have to losing, s- just after losing your cousin like you're right your exactly cousin. like you just murdered my cousin. Of course I'm not going to surrender. <laughs> and so since the the game says okay, to get out of this you have to quit while you're winning. You can't win. Nobody like and and so you got your army. It's so funny. It's such a bloodbath. I love it. And um people struggle to Understand it and then hate it when they understand oh, it. Oh, yeah, fun. it's a delightful. Track. Not not everybody. It's no. my favorite game, but I, I I shouldn't say I'm the only one who likes it. No, um, it's it's a great game. But it really like I've seen that anime so many times where you know you have to get into the tragedy of the armies getting mm-hmm, mm-hmm. shot to pieces and you know oh. Merrill Link flees <laughs> in the blood on his yeah. Botan's Hunter Merrill Link or yeah. some of those Gundams where what's well. His name? One of the important things... Hathaway Noah is screaming and crying in his <laughs> Gundam. One of the things that's important there is this is not... This whole Firebrands, but tactical skirmish in particular, but Firebrands in general, is not a game about how great it is to be a soldier. It's yeah. not a game about the glorious adventures. It's not a PR piece for re- recruiting people to join the you know intergalactic mech force. It's about this is messy. Yeah. And then I'm going to come out from this. We're going to come out from this game where like, we've been torn to crap. And I'm going to say ten, that Rach is like, all right, so I'm going to steal time with you. And I'm, I'm like, ha, huh, ha, huh, right? Big, all my people died. And now you're saying, may I kiss your hand? <laughs> like, ha, huh. drama, drama. <laughs> anyway, it's exciting. McGay, do you have a different? I really like meeting sword to sword, but the one I like most and I've seen used in the most interesting ways is a dance because of the way that people can interpret how people move in the dance. And there's an instance of it that I like best where we were all part of the dance. And in that moment, the exchange was, in this moment, your mouth is close to my ear. What do you say? And it was between two people who could not stand each other. And so it was this bit of saying this little, like, social cut. Because they, they came close in the dance and they, like, made some totally disparaging remark about them even being there because it was so above their station to be at the stage. Oh, so much drama. Yeah, it was so good, right? Because that's one of the things I like about the many of these games is stealing time together is pretty explicitly about little romantic sexual titillating it, flirtatious. It's so funny. Yeah. All of these games are inside out. Yeah. Upside down. They're mirror images of the games. The, yeah. Well, I mean, they're mirror images of social conflict. They're mirror images of what if we treat a social interaction like a fight? Yep. Stealing time together, everybody's heart starts to race, right? Yeah. Like it's supercharged, dangerous, sexy stuff. And it's things like, I touch your wrist, may I? 
and everybody's like, uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> because it's really the person making the overture is the vulnerable person. Mm -hmm. Because negotiated consent is sexy. <laughs> yeah, but just that position of vulnerability and reaching out yeah. and, and approaching someone. A game where there's so much vulnerability in such little overtures, mm -hmm. like if there were anything that were even sex, or even oh, yeah. anything like sex in yeah. this game, people would just right. fly away from well, it. Like like the, there, there would be no playing it. The thing is that all um, the advances are, I touch your wrist, may I? And the answers are anywhere from... You may to you may not, and I break off and depart. Yeah, the control and the agency is always on the, the part of the person who sets where the level is. Which yeah. is nice. All right. Yeah. So now, what we know what your favorite mini games are. Why don't we take a step over here to playing the games, and we might try one out to let our listeners get a taste of Mobile Frame Zero Firebrands. On your turn, pick a game. <laughs> In playing the games, our guest will showcase one of the mini games in their Firebrands game, in this case, the OG Mobile Frame Zero Firebrands. All right, so let's set the stage as I'm a player, I've made my character and character gen, I have all these mini games in front of me. Where should I start? There's so many choices. You're supposed to start with solitaire. Mm -hmm. And that's on purpose. That's to give you something to talk about in the games that come after. In solitaire, each of us has chosen a faction. And so what you do is you just choose an option from your, your faction. So I'm going to say I'm a landowner and I'm going to choose, I've been drinking off duty, relaxing with my fellow soldiers. And the next day, revolutionaries firebombed the establishment. And we each play privately to ourselves at the same time before we start playing the, the games proper. And so that gives each of us something that we're bringing to the first game. The hope there is that after that point, with that priming, any of the first games will work. Any okay. of the games will work as a first game. If we go straight to a conversation over food, conversation over food is often a hard game to get going unless we can talk about that stuff. But it, it should help us even if we choose conversation over food. Conversation over food is great in the, the later game when we can talk about all the stuff that's happened in the game so far. Same as an animated disagreement. But Meg, if you're playing a revolutionary and that's what I chose for solitaire, we can go straight into an animated disagreement for sure. I'm just saying for yeah. the first game. Yeah. Not that we would do that now, but that it would be a huh. good choice. for It would be possible yeah. for the first game. I like to start with a free for all? Yeah. That's I, that's my first choice in a lot of games. You usually start with a chase. A chase, really? Yeah, a chase. So one of the things that I'm drawing on is experience running this game at conventions. Do you remember conventions? There used to be conventions. With a chase, what I like to do for that is it gives a chance for us to have made our characters and then to see a game in play. And it, it goes pretty quick. And then people will be like, oh, okay. And now a next thing. But we can do a free-for-all. Let's do a free-for-all. Why not? Because that also the difference is in a free-for-all, everyone plays. And in a chase, you have a hundred on your board. Yeah. Free-for-all. What do we do? How do we play? I do recommend, just as Vincent said, look at the solitaire because it does help even to know what faction we're on. Yeah, we should, if, we should you're a landowner. Yeah. So I'm going to be the landowners. And so... And you're going to be a land. Not playing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm playing a landowner. The landowners are the off-world investors mm -hmm. in the planet who now think that they own it. Yeah. The Ben Fash are the people who've lived here for generations. And um, the, uh, they may be, who knows, they may be trying to make the best of a bad situation. They may be trying to make a buck. Who the, knows? The Ben Fash are the ancestral yeah. ruling class. Yeah. And the revolutionaries are revolutionary. Let's just choose factions and go straight into the free ball. Okay. I'm going to be a revolutionary. I can't say no to being a revolutionary as well. Do you want to team up? Yeah. Well, I guess I will be a Ben Trish. Rich is very salt of the earth. It's a good fit, yes. I think. All right. So we're revolutionaries. You, you think you own the place. <laughs> yeah. And Rich thinks he owns the place. Yeah, I think you're both. And wrong. you all think you own the place. Yeah. just because you. Who's doing the work? I mean, Rich is probably doing the work. Maybe. Whose side are you on? <laughs> <laughs> 
We're trying to encourage the local people to join our cause. If they're not with us, they're against us. I mean, it's right here. He can step up or not, but. <laughs> okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the setup. Okay. Everyone plays. That's us. Everyone's characters meet in our mobile frames to do battle. Chosen partner. What's that about? Where, where does the free for all take place? Where are we meeting the four of us to do battle? Rach, where are we meeting them? Oh, we got to be meeting them like at the break of dawn on a field. There's like some wind blowing through the crops. It's very dramatic. Got some like golden blue sky in the morning. Cool. My mech is green and yellow and has a very stylized stag on the side. John Deere is forever. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you'd seen the quizzical look that yeah, you gave me. That was good. That's good. My mobile frame. I'm a professional soldier. It's a professional military mobile frame. Kind of high end. Seen some action. Not enough. Not see more. Oh, my mobile frame, because I did play a little bit of solitaire, I'm very struck at the idea I stole a Night Guard's frame. It's got the corporate logos all sprayed off. I haven't repainted it yet, so it kind of looks like it should have the markings of a corporate mech, but that's been spray painted over, very obviously. Awesome. See? I know what side you're on. Yeah. As a Bentresh, the royal, I have a beautiful purple and blue magnificent mech that that stands just a little tall i had it built just a little taller than the regular mechs <laughs> so that i could look down it's got platforms at my enemies it's it's shiny silver and white in and yeah it's probably not seen battle yet i'm already eyeing your ankle and knee joints they're beautiful they're very expensive <laughs> Now we go around the table. Each of us gets two turns, and I go first. On your turn, choose an enemy player's character and give them a challenge to answer. So, Rach. Yeah. I'm going to choose one of these challenges. I rush you. I'm faster than you'd believe. Can you react in time and get away? And how? I don't think I react in time to get away. This is a mech I have stolen very recently. Instead... I'm going to buckle down and try to brace to take the impact and see if I can grind myself into the ground, hopefully accidentally on purpose, pin you in place. Hmm. Perfect. That's awesome. All right. You, you're up, Mike. My turn. Okay. <laughs> Rich, I'm going to, I'm farming equipment. I have this big, uh, big claw bits. I'm going to heave you bodily off the ground, uh, lift you up and smash you down. Are you able to get out of my grip? And if so, how? I can do anything with this mech. Oh, oh my. I am surprised at just the level of violence that you throw at me. You, you, Would you heave me off of the ground and smash me down again? Yeah. I just like fall down. I, I grab you by the knee. You know, I grab you. Lift, like, the sound of scraping metal. Boy, that paint job. Yeah, there's a little piece of my HUD that's showing the amount of credits that are damaged that's being done <laughs> to the mech. I freak out a little bit and then I'm screaming that I have to remove one of my very expensive haptic gloves to actually hit the buttons. Uh, and I am able to fire some little jet boosters to fly out of your grip just barely, but I hear the sickening crunch of metal on one of my beautiful ankle joints nice now over here at this table we're just going around clockwise but i don't know who's clockwise from meg so it should be one of you <laughs> it should be rage yeah so vincent yeah we're locked i'm bunkling down i open fire on you i figure out where the controls are and i figure out how to attack back pounding you with everything this mech's got can your frame take it? How? Ho, 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 ho. Whoa. Gonna blow both of us up. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, my frame can take a lot of it. My frame can take an awful lot of it, but it can't take, this you frame is as good as mine, here. right? Like yeah. this, oops. I do manage to get away and avoid the tail end of it, 
But no, like my arm is cloth and I'm smoking and staggering back away from you. No, I can't take it at all. I, uh, I'm sad that that happened. <laughs> I'm not. I'm cheering loudly. Well, of course, Meg, uh, I would choose you. I fall out of the sky like a hunting bird. Oh, man. Do you survive my attack? How? I'm a little distracted because of this excellent move that Rach just did. That was awesome and all good. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to come plummeting down out of the sky because you jetted up into there. And what, what comes up must come down. I think we're locked together now. I survive, but whatever it was you used to pin my neck down, you can't get out of you. Yeah, I don't like that at all. <laughs> that was not my plan. Oops. Okay, Rach, I bet you don't know this trick. I get the drop on you by venting my um, jump jets out the front. I get the drop on you and hit you with a roaring jet of flame steel meltingly hot. Can your frame take it? I don't think my frame can take it. I think the weapons array that I figured out how to unlock melts under the raging heat. Oops. Is it my turn? It is. Okay. All right. So my cultivator mech here has like, let's say 50 little tentacly seed planter depositor arms. You know, we're locked together. And I'm just going to send these little, they're probably like maybe the size of a pencil, maybe your pinky finger, extremely flexible little tubes. And I'm just going to send them all up into your biz. And I'm targeting your circuitry to just, yeah, glad right on. I do. Oh. Can you survive it, dodge it, or, or, or hold me off? Yeah, I'm infiltrating your circuitry. Can you survive it, dodge it, or hold me off? Oh, wow. I hear the klaxons, uh, everything is flashing red. This isn't fair? The, what? So Whoa. you hear my voice? I'm going to... Can I get, do an ending condition or are we no. at that? Yeah. Okay, cool. Do you say this isn't fair? Yes. Awesome. So I'm like, there's very little that's fair about this. And then we'll pass it to whoever's next. Preach. Oh, I'm going to be very mean then. So I'm going to actually be targeting Rich's mech at this point after the skirmish I've had with Vincent's. Far across the landscape, I raise my rifle. I could put a shot in your reactor core, Rich. <laughs> help! Help! We're both going to die! Do you avoid my shot and how? I personally avoid the shot because I've realized this isn't fair. Oh, no! This mech was not designed very well. I need to write a strongly worded letter to the manufacturer, and I wish to eject. Oh, 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 I love that. Yes, I'm going to eject. I'll just get a better mech next time. Leaving your shiny purple suit. I'm a plant trees in it. Very shiny. So you have, you have technically one more turn, Rich, if you want it. Otherwise, right. we've each taken two turns. That is true. I do technically. I think I will forego my last turn because I'm trying to eject out of this. I'm, I'm out. This was not fair. Great. Then so, uh, so it comes back around to me and I choose an ending. And I think that with you out of the fight, we weren't exactly allies, but now I'm all the way outnumbered. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm going to choose we fight fiercely, we continue to fight fiercely but it threatens to spill over into civilian areas and rather than put innocents in danger the reason it threatens to spill over into civilian areas is because I make a dash for civilian areas where your friends live yeah we're not going there so rather than put innocents da in danger you leave the fight on the Yeah, I'm satisfied with that vengeance will come another day that was a bad fight that was a bad fight, but I am uh, psyched because I think that Rich being like, hey, this isn't fair. I see a possible opening there. I think we can get Rich on, on the, the side of the revolutionaries. None of this is fair. He wouldn't have been there if, if you hadn't been there. 
Vincent and Meg, if our listeners want to follow more of your works online, where can they find you to? The main place right now is lumply.games. Mm-hmm. Um, we're on Patreon at patreon.com slash lumply. We're on Twitter. I'm lumply games and Meg is night sky games. Uh, let's see. Lumply.com is also ours and we'll get you some places. I'm, all, I'm the only McGay, M-E-G-U-E-Y. I'm the only McGay on the planet. So if you Google that, it's me. And I'm that on Twitter and on Mastodon. Well, McGay and Vincent, thank you both so much for coming on the show and helping us launch this new summer series. Thank you so much. It's been a great time. I'm really excited to see what Firebrand's framework games you have on and where it takes you because there's a lot of them out there now that are really cool. Plus One Forward is a production of the Gauntlet community, Richard Rogers and Rach Schalke. You can find us at gauntlet-rpg.com or follow us on Twitter at at plus one FWD. If you would like to support our show, visit our Patreon site at patreon.com slash gauntlet. The games mentioned on this show use the Apocalypse Engine, which is a creation of Vincent and McGay Baker. The music for Plus One Forward is from the Savage Aural Hotbed CD, Gomi Daiko. The songs used are Gomi Daiko, Metal Version, and Drowning Attitude. You can find more amazing tunes by Savage Aural Hotbed on their website, www.savagearlhotbed.com. You can now get Hearts of Wulin Worlds on Drive Through RPG. This supplement for Hearts of Wulin includes alternate settings and new mechanics. In it, you'll find Shadow of the Joseon, a historical Korean setting, 1905 San Francisco, Chinatown in the shadow of the Chinese Exclusion Act, Cor de la Epée, a fantastic swashbuckling France, Academy of the Blade, an anime-inspired dueling school, Fight Me IRL, a cyberpunk corporatized future, and Silk and Steam, a silk punk fantasy setting. As well, Hearts of Lin Worlds contains a new core playbook, detailed options for running Wuxia Mysteries, and more. You can get the PDF, as well as the core Hearts of Lin book, at our drive through publisher site, bit.ly forward slash gauntlet hyphen publishing.